Welcome to the Jenna Ellis Show, sponsored by Legacy Precious Metals. There has never been a better time to invest in precious metals. Visit LegacyPMInvestments.com. That's LegacyPMInvestments.com. I'm Jenna Ellis, host of Jenna Ellis Tonight on the Salem News Channel. Join us at 9 p.m. for a very interesting debate between our legal eagles on Trump's appeal and can a future president, if Trump is elected in November, pardon himself? And does that apply to a state crime that has a federal predicate? A lot of interesting questions that we will discuss with our legal scholars, and we'll also address the question of J6ers. Can a president grant amnesty or a blanket pardon? All of these questions and so much more are very important legally for us to discuss right now. Plus, we're going to address some of the cultural issues with Walker Wildman and a host of other guests here on Jenna Ellis tonight. So tune in at the Salem News Channel, download the app wherever you stream at 9 p.m. Eastern. See you there. Hi friends, Jenna Ellis, host of Jenna Ellis Tonight, and we are experiencing instability at every level. Our government lacks leadership and Bidenomics has been an utter disaster. The economy is in a fragile state. Inflation has been a constant issue. High interest rates have put significant pressure on the real estate market. There have been major bank failures and many analysts say a stock market correction is likely overdue. We have global conflicts in Europe and the Middle East and those have the potential to spread, but gold has soared to record highs even among the tensions. So there are so many reasons that Americans should consider wise investing and investments in gold and silver and legacy precious metals is the gold standard. I love Legacy Precious Metals because of their zero hassle education first approach. They can help you roll your traditional IRA into a gold IRA or ship metals directly to your house. Go to LegacyPMInvestments.com, download the free investor guide, and I have read it. There is so much valuable information there. Friends, now is the time to not roll the dice on your hard earned money, find out about the growth potential that is in gold and that gold offers you. Contact Legacy Precious Metals and make sure to tell them that I sent you. And welcome to Jenna Ellis tonight. So as the world awaits the July 11th sentencing hearing for former President Donald Trump out of those ridiculous charges in Manhattan and the conviction, the question, of course, has arisen, will he appeal? The answer to that is yes. But how successful will those appeals be? Also, there's the issue of presidential pardon. If, in fact, Donald Trump is reelected in November, could he pardon himself? And does that pardon apply to the New York situation? There are two or at, at least two different schools of thought on this. So who better to bring in than two of the most brilliant legal minds that I know? So we will get ready to introduce our legal eagles. Mike Donnelly is a law professor and attorney, and Josh Hammer is an attorney and senior editor at large at Newsweek. And gentlemen, I'm so excited for this conversation because when I asked both of you uh, just in our conversations, and both of you are kind of some of my go-tos for legal questions and your thoughtful analysis, uh, both of you had a very different opinion on this, which is something that I love about the practice of law and the philosophy of law is that lawyers often arrive at different legal conclusions based on uh, different theories of the case. And so the theory of presidential pardon and whether whether or not Trump can uh, pardon himself and that would apply to state level charges that are predicated on federal offenses uh, really is the question. And so uh, for this debate, Mike Donnelly, you've kind of taken the affirmative position that yes, that is possible. So I'll let you go first. Uh, what's your legal theory? Well, the, the Constitution says that the president has the ability to grant reprieves and pardons for offenses against the United States. It doesn't contain any limitation in terms of to whom those pardons and reprieves can be granted. Uh, no president has ever pardoned himself. Um, presidents have been pardoned, however, by at least once uh, Gerald Ford pardoned President Nixon. 
Um, and, you know, it's been discussed. The Congressional Research Service has a paper on this, which I find interesting. And it, and it says that it's not clear whether the president can or cannot pardon himself. Um, what is clear is that the Supreme Court has granted a lot of deference to the president in terms of his ability under the Constitution to pardon and a grant a variety of relief under the pardon and reprieve power, which includes amnesties and commutations and a variety of other uh, relief when asked. There are some rules that have been created by the executive branch about how you get a pardon and how you get a commutation. But those rules, you know, are for the convenience of the president. They're not, they don't bind him. Uh, the president can grant this relief however he wants. And uh, I think he can give it to himself. That's my view. Um, we can talk some more about it. I'm eager to hear what Josh has to say about this. Well, and I want you to ask, before I go to Josh, I want you to answer specifically the question of whether the president could pardon himself on the issue of state level charges in New York, because this does involve a federal predicate. That's right. And so, right. So, the, so the 34 felony counts, which he was allegedly convicted of, and again, we can keep using the term sham trial all we want, um, but included in how it got to be a felony. Right. Alvin Bragg said there are these two two misdemeanors or this one well, two misdemeanors is how he got around the statute of limitations, which ran out on these misdemeanors in 2019. And then he used those to bolt them together in furtherance of another crime, which we didn't know for a while what the heck he was talking about until later in the trial when he said, oh, it's a federal election crime. OK, well, that's under federal law. And so if the jury convicted President Trump of a felony, predicated on a federal offense, okay, then clearly the president can pardon federal offenses. And there is Supreme Court case law which says that you cannot sustain a conviction if a uh, person has been pardoned of that federal offense. I don't remember the case name, but I'll be happy to send it off to Josh after this if he still disagrees with me. <laughs> All right. And Josh, I think you probably still do disagree with uh, with Mike Donnelly, but what's your take on this? Yeah, I mean, I'm sorry to kind of burst the bubble here. I think that there's a bit of conflation of issues. I, I don't disagree with uh, Mr. Donnelly as much as I probably think I do. So, I mean, first of all, when it comes to straight up federal offenses, um, so, you know, if, if Donald Trump were to be convicted in either of Jack Smith's trials in Florida or Washington, D.C., I 100% think that he could indeed pardon himself. I've been a very vocal and, and vociferous proponent of that opinion for a long time now. So we're really here j just talking about the the two state trials in, in Georgia and New York State. So the New York State prosecution is is complicated. I think that's a very, you know, that's putting a, a very kind gloss on it. I mean, call it Stalinist, call it show me the man, I'll find you the crime. All of that happens to, to apply here. But we didn't actually learn. We didn't actually learn until uh, what the prosecution's literal legal theory of the case was, at least I didn't, until the jury instructions came down. Here is what the prosecution's theory of the case, how it turns out that it is. It's 34 counts, as we know, of misdemeanor New York State fraudulent bookkeeping that the Trump organization has done in furtherance of another crime. That other crime is a state crime. It is a New York State campaign finance law. That statute, in turn, then says that it is first degree New York State campaign finance violation to do so and so via unlawful means. Then the third step down the rabbit hole, the unlawful means, that's when you get three possible predicate offenses. One is the Federal Campaign Finance Act. The other two are actually state crimes, a New York State tax law evasion and then a New York State fraudulent bookkeeping misdemeanor. So even if we were to stipulate for the sake of argument, as lawyers often like to do, that that the underlying offense of the federal campaign uh, of the federal campaign finance law that you actually could pardon yourself because that is the predicate offense. We don't actually know that that was the predicate offense because Mershon's jury instructions very clearly said that the jury could deadlock 444 as to what the unlawful means were. And as the case may be, two of the three specified unlawful means happen to be state crimes, not even federal. So I don't think this ultimately flies. Now, having said that, there were myriad glaring constitutional issues here. I think Donald Trump's due process clause violations were violated through, through ample numerous reasons. I think his Sixth Amendment, uh, Sixth Amendment rights were actually violated as well. The prosecution literally didn't even inform the defendant what the nature of his charges were until the jury instructions were read. To me, that's a glaring re reversible error Sixth Amendment problem. A lot of problems here, but I, I'm not sure he can pardon himself in this very specific, specific situation. 
Yeah, and that's a really interesting argument, Josh, and you're right. I think that we all agree here, and, and most legal scholars do, that there are myriad issues that are uh, ripe for appeal, and also that the president uh, likely can pardon himself at least for federal cases and alleged federal crimes. And so the question really for today that I'm the most interested in is, is the New York uh, the New York verdict and whether or not uh, that particular issue, because there is a potential federal pred predicate, whether that could potentially be pardoned. And as you mentioned, the jury instructions uh, allow for the jury to be split. And I don't know that we actually know if they agreed or had a split on which potential predicate it was. And so is that going to, in your mind, create a problem? Let's say that we do stipulate that if it was a federal predicate, then Trump could pardon himself. That dissolves the whole question. But we don't know whether or not the jury found federal versus state predicate. Um, could that potentially be something litigated down the road that is a, is now problematic based on the jury instruction that didn't require unanimity? Well, I think that you can definitely take up a, a constitutional appeal as to the unconstitutionality of the jury instructions as given. I, I mean, I think that there is a very clear and blatant due process concern violation there. As I mentioned, there's a Sixth Amendment concern as well. The fact that the criminal defendant was literally not informed of the nature of his charges here. The idea that you could not have unanimity as to the underlying predicate offense is a slap in the face of hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years of Anglo-American jurisprudence in general there. So there, there are a lot of glaring problems problems, but I don't necessarily see a way to possibly suss out on appeal exactly how the 12 members of the jury decided. I mean, they probably never took a formal vote even. I, I could be wrong about that, but they didn't have to. They were literally told as long as you think that there was an unlawful means. That's not the kind of thing that is judicially cognizable, you might say. Yeah. All right. Your, your thoughts in response, Mike. Yeah, I think, Jenny, your listeners have been treated to perhaps the most comprehensive and incisive description of the problem in this case by Josh. Josh, that was great. And I agree with what Josh is saying. You know, I I haven't delved into this as in much detail uh, as Josh has, so I appreciate that. I, you know, the, the due process claims, very problematic. And I feel like one of the things that the Trump legal team should be thinking about is possibly certiorari. Josh, I'd be curious what you think about that. But, you know, the due process cases, uh, issue on due process, the Sixth Amendment violation. I mean, I feel like the Trump team could request the Supreme Court to review this pretty quickly under Rule 10 of the rules, which says a federal, you know, that this court has addressed a federal question. And that's something that the Supreme Court has a lot of discretion over. Yeah. And Josh, what do you think about that? Because uh, the Supreme Court is very quickly going to go into its recess and won't reconvene until October. Um, is there precedent or is there anything you know that prohibits them from coming back into session just to address this type of appeal if they want to before the election? So, uh, look, I, I, I intuitively am very sympathetic to the folks clamoring to expedite this to the Supreme Court. Mark Levin's been very outspoken on this. I, I, I hear that. That makes a lot of intuitive sense to me. Uh, I, I'm skeptical for at least two reasons. One is that it, it's black letter Supreme Court procedure that they will not review a state criminal case until there has been a highest or there's been a ruling, a verdict from the highest court in the land. So in, in New York, that's the Court of Appeals based in Albany. That's just black letter New York law. I mean, even going back to Bush versus Gore, which is not a criminal case, it was a civil case, they did reach the Supreme Court of Florida before going to the Supreme Court of the United States. But the second more philosophical worry that I have here is that in fast tracking in this manner, you're going to bypass multiple possible levels of relief, the New York Court of Appeals perhaps in particular, and you're really going to put all of your eggs in the basket then of John Roberts, Brett Kavanaugh, Amy Coney Barrett. In other words, if you expedite there and you fast track, you might not be able to kind of then go back, you know, begging for mercy at the lower court that you just chose to expedite there. I know I, for one, don't necessarily want to put all my hopes and dreams in the basket of John Roberts, Brett Kavanaugh, and Amy Coney Barrett. Yeah, well, Sam, we're already out of time for this segment, but I hope that listeners understand how complex these issues are. There's a lot more layers than just whether you love or hate Trump, and that's why I love these type of legal evil panels. We're going to be addressing another topic when we come right back. Well, 
girlfriends, you might have heard that Mike Lindell and MyPillow no longer have the support of their box stores or shopping channels the way that they used to. They've been part of this cancel culture, so they want to pass along the savings directly to you by having a $25 extravaganza. I love that word, extravaganza. <laughs> when Mike started MyPillow, it was just a one product company. With the help of his dedicated employees, they now have hundreds of products, some you may not even know about. To get the word out, I want to invite my listeners to check out their $25 extravaganza. Two pack multi use My Pillows are just $25. My Pillow sandals, also awesome, only $25. Their six pack towel sets are $25. And brand new four pack dish towels, you guessed it, just $25. For the first time ever, the premium My Pillows with the all new Giza fabric, just $25. And orders over $75 will receive free shipping too. This amazing offer won't last long. Go to mypello.com, use the promo code Jenna, or call 800 564 8475 today. That's 800 564 8475, or go to mypello.com and use the promo code Jenna. And we're back with our legal eagles, Mike Donnelly and Josh Hammer, to address another issue, which is what to do with the J6ers. And so optics in the court of public opinion really turns on whether you are a Trump supporter or a Trump hater, and you put all of the J6ers kind of into one bucket of nobody did anything wrong or everybody was the worst criminal in the world, and this was, you know, worse than uh, you know, anything ever that's happened in the history of the world, even including the Civil War. I mean, it's it's ridiculous. And I think that both of those two positions uh, fail logically and legally for several reasons. And one of the most stark examples of this, in my opinion, and feel free to disagree, gentlemen, uh, is the case of InfoWars Owen Schreuer, who took a plea agreement for trespass. Now, he was charged, and some of those who were with him that were also inside the Capitol building were not. And prosecutors in that case said that the reason that they took his trespassing more seriously is because he was under court order to stay away from federal buildings. And I don't know the exact extent of it, but that at least included the Capitol building based on some of his earlier activity um, during some of uh, the, the judiciary hearings. And so since he violated that court order, they felt that it was necessary uh, to pursue him more aggressively. He took a plea agreement, but then vowed for some reason, probably I'm assuming optics, to take that to the Supreme Court and challenge it anyway under a First Amendment theory. The Supreme Court just routinely out of hand said, no, we're not going to listen to your cert um, and we're not going to entertain this. And all of the Trump supporters, generally speaking, MAGA is saying this is a miscarriage of justice and look at all this, but they're failing to actually see the facts here. So my question for both of you is how should a reasonable, rational conservative and uh, how should we navigate the issue of dealing with J6ers? Trump has vowed to pardon basically everyone. Uh, and of course, the leftists are saying everyone deserves to be locked up for 20 years. I don't agree with either of those positions. I actually take the DeSantis approach that says maybe we should look at this on a case by case basis. Uh, but what can and should President Trump do if he is elected? And Josh, I will turn to you first. Yeah, so with the glaring caveat that I have definitely not closely followed this particular individual's case, what I can tell you is that when I was a federal law clerk on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit, you know, it is fairly well established case law that any plea deal that is reached is entitled to very, very strong deference. I mean, there are, you know, there are reasons to not accept a plea deal. In fact, we actually just saw last year Hunter Biden's plea deal that, that, that he reached was actually rejected by the judge there, Judge Noriega, who's currently presiding over Hunter's federal gun trial. So, so there obviously are times to, to to reject a plea deal, but you know, generally speaking, when 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 you have a plea deal, you know, as lawyers say, there is certainly a rebuttable presumption that the plea deal has been reached in good faith. You can overcome that presumption there. But I, I I don't have a particularly strong inclination to kind of join those who are saying that this was a miscarriage of justice if, if assuming that the that the underlying plea deal was reached mutually and and amicably. More generally, when it comes to the plight of the J6 prisoners, Jenna, yeah. I, I agree with you. I mean, call it the DeSantis approach, call it just the common sense approach if you want to. I mean, going case by case, you know, that's how the law works. I mean, that's literally how the law works. I mean, it's right there, you know, in Article 3 of the Constitution, which establishes the federal judiciary. They use the, the, the nomenclature of 
so-called case or controversy. And they literally specify that there are individual cases or controversies. That's how it works. I mean, you have a, a specific litigation where there are named parties to the suit. Every case is unique. Every fact pattern is unique here. The law is the law, but how the law applies to a specific set of facts is going to invariably change with every single case. Yeah, and so Mike Donnelly, what do you think about that? Because there are a lot of um, MAGA uh, inclined individuals will call them that, that that want just this blanket pardon for everyone, including uh, people who weren't even even inside the Capitol. Um, but then they that would also include even people who allegedly uh, committed violent acts that day. So um, what what do you think about this call for J6 amnesty? Well, the president can issue an amnesty, and President Carter issued some amnesty and pardons with respect to people who avoided the draft and did not follow the selective service law back in the late 70s. Um, you know, is that equivalent? I'm not sure that's equivalent. I tend to agree with a lot of what Josh said with respect to treating people on a case-by-case -case basis, but that's that's challenging. You've got hundreds, if not thousands. I mean, I'm not really sure how many people have been prosecuted uh, for being in the Capitol or being around the Capitol. I've heard stories about people being prosecuted who weren't even anywhere near the Capitol uh, for being involved uh, somehow in, in this, uh, what some people call an insurrection. I don't go that far. I don't, I wouldn't call it insurrection. Uh, and so the mechanics of it, I think, is important uh, for the president. You know, is he going to go through an individual review of every single case? That would take a really long time. And there are people I know, not that I know personally, but I know there are people who are in prison who probably shouldn't be in prison right now. And so this is something if President Trump does win, he's going to have to grapple with this. I think he could put some conditions and parameters around a general amnesty for people who were convicted of certain lower level offenses who were maybe not in the building or who did not commit any kind of violence or did not actually break anything. And so you give the Justice Department some marching orders and you say, go find these people and get them out of prison. Yeah. And so, Josh, what do you think about that in terms of, you know, not a comparison in terms of similarly situated, but at least just the uh, legal proposition that some general grant of amnesty could be provided with you know, some common sense parameters? Yeah, I, I, I actually agree with everything that Mike just said. That, that, that makes a ton of sense to me, frankly. Um, you know, if you are you totally could give a, a, a blanket mass pardon those who, you know, stipulate that did not actually enter the U.S. Capitol. Look, if you wanted to actually, you know, just give a mass pardon to everyone involved, you you, you, could, you could do that, too. There's nothing that, 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 that would constitutionally preclude that. You know, the point that I was just making about the plea deal, rather, in that particular context is that it's just a general principle of, of, of the judiciary, that when a plea deal is reached, that it is afforded some level of, of, of deference, oftentimes veering on very strong deference there. But when it comes to the issue of presidential pardons, you know, look, I, I am definitely of the opinion that the January 6 prisoners have been severely mistreated by the most part by our criminal justice system. I have no doubt whatsoever that all of the relevant prosecutors and, and in many cases judges involved here have an intense dripping animus for those who found themselves at the U.S. Capitol on January 6, 2021 there. And, you know, I would have no personal objection whatsoever to any kind of mass pardon of those, at least those who are not committing any kind of of, of glaring, glaring black letter criminal offense. So, you know, you know, punching others, you know, you know, punching police officers, whatever there. But if they were just happened to be there, you know, traipsing around the U.S. Capitol on, on the grounds there. Yeah. I mean, if I were president, I would definitely issue a pardon for those people. Yeah, and I think that that makes sense. And again, with you know some of those parameters, because while the optics in the court of public opinion would like to make this um, easier often <laughs> than uh, than it is, it is a little bit more complex than that. It is um, a a general understanding that that a lot of these J sixers are be are being treated unfairly. And I think for political purposes, when you look at some of the severe penalties and even some of the ways um, that. Uh, that they were charged. And, you know, that's still a question, Mike Donnelly, um, before the U.S. Supreme Court in terms of being able to use a statute that um, really was, I believe, intended for the KKK that the DOJ has um, has used to invoke even harsher penalties. And we're about under a minute, but address that, if you would, really quickly. Well, all right, you're talking about a conspiracy against rights, the 1870 Act that was designed to really get at the KKK and protect blacks who had been freed. Uh, and and the, the DOJ has been using that in the cases to prosecute and get harsher penalties for those who have been outside of abortion clinics praying or in some cases doing more than that, which maybe they shouldn't be going inside the clinic. Uh, but yes, that's what they've been doing. They've been using that.
to conspiracy theory. We got a lot of conspiracy theory going on around. Yeah, the and and so it sh it should be that the law uh, provides punishment for people who have actual proper notice of what they uh, what they are charged with, which of course didn't happen in Trump's case. But we're already out of time for this segment. Really appreciate it. again so many layers to this. We'll be right back with more here on Jenna Ellis tonight. Hi friends, Jenna Ellis, host of Jenna Ellis Tonight, and we are experiencing instability at every level. Our government lacks leadership and Bidenomics has been an utter disaster. The economy is in a fragile state. Inflation has been a constant issue. High interest rates have put significant pressure on the real estate market. There have been major bank failures and many analysts say a stock market correction is likely overdue. We have global conflicts in Europe and the Middle East and those have the potential to spread, but gold has soared to record highs even among the tensions. So there are so many reasons that Americans should consider wise investing and investments in gold and silver and legacy precious metals is the gold standard. I love Legacy Precious Metals because of their zero hassle education first approach. They can help you roll your traditional IRA into a gold IRA or ship metals directly to your house. Go to LegacyPMInvestments.com, download the free investor guide, and I have read it. There is so much valuable information there. Friends, now is the time to not roll the dice on your hard-earned money, find out about the growth potential that is in gold and that gold offers you. Contact Legacy Precious Metals and make sure to tell them that I sent you. So President Joe Biden has issued an executive order ostensibly curbing the a problem at the border, but really we all know that this is just optics because he is terrified of the conservatives making the border the number one issue in America, which it should be. But unfortunately, this executive order has really dominated the news and obfuscated a really also important question coming out of the congressional hearings yesterday from Dr. Fauci and his testimony about all of the COVID nonsense that he actually admitted was just totally made up. So I had the opportunity to interview Representative Tom Tiffany this morning on my radio show, and here's what he had to say about those congressional hearings. Will we face any accountability for Dr. Fauci? So, Jenna, really good to join you. I'm, I'm so happy you bring up Fauci because no one should be happier than the announcement that President Biden made yesterday than Anthony Fauci because it knocked him off from the front pages of the newspaper and um, off from, you know, people giving full scrutiny to what, um, what he did. Because what Anthony Fauci did was I think it's it, it's something that is a once in a generation event, which should be the American people should be reminded of regularly. I had not attended uh, a school board meeting for probably 20 years, Jenna, before this whole COVID thing hit, and then they put the restrictions in place, and I had to fight tooth and nail against the county health officer in northern Wisconsin in the school district where my kids went to school. I had to go and fight against her tooth and nail. And all she would say is that the federal government and Anthony Fauci are saying we have to do these things. You know, the six feet social distancing, the masking, and boy, we should be shutting down our schools. It is one of the most evil things that has happened ever in America. And we need to make sure the American American people never forget it, and especially the, gen the young generation that went through it when they were seniors in high school, now graduating from college, and you think about all the loss of learning that happened with that generation, we have to remind them as they become voters what Anthony Fauci and big government did to them. Yes, so well said. And I, I'm old enough to remember uh, when Dr. Fauci said, I am the science. And, and apparently he meant that literally, that he was just fabricating all of this nonsense out of thin air and passing it off as trust the science, believe in the science. And I put that in air quotes when it was really just his own maniacal plot foisted on the country that had no grounding in legitimate, rational, actual science. And, and yet 
he he just seemed so unbothered during his testimony and the portions that I got to watch and, of course, the clips after. And so I think the American people do want to know where will the accountability be for Fauci for all of these decisions that truly impacted America and I still believe are impacting America today. Well, it, it deeply concerns me that does he have sociopathic tendencies? And I know we're not here to do a psychological analysis of Anthony Fauci, but in your description of his testimony where he's saying things like, yeah, well, maybe that wasn't the best thing to do. Or in regards to six feet of social distancing, yeah, it's something I said. Now, I don't know why they picked up on that. They picked up on it because you were basically instructing people to do it and they trusted you. They trusted you. And you told people you were the science. And so why wouldn't you not expect people to follow what you are saying? Uh, I got to tell you, it is something that we got to make sure the American people never, ever forget what he did to the American people. And he should go down in history as one of the most, what's the term that I would use, Jenna? One of the most reviled figures in the history of America for what he did. So well said by Representative Tiffany. You can listen to the full interview at AFR.net. Click the icon for Jenna Ellis in the morning. You can always listen to my radio program each and every weekday morning from 8 to 9 Eastern or the podcast again at AFR.net. But this absolutely cannot happen again in American history. And I hope that we have legislative solutions coming from a bipartisan Congress that recognizes we need to protect Americans' liberty. We'll be right back with more. Is there really such a thing as meaningful justice in our criminal justice system or our institutions here in America? Well, increasingly, it doesn't seem so, specifically for conservatives and Christians. This headline coming from Town Hall, in a case you're probably familiar with, a pro-life grandmother sentenced to two years in prison as a D.C. judge appears to mock her poor health. Joining me now is Walker Wildman, who's the vice president of the American Family Association and host of At The Core on AFR, where I'm also the host of Jenna Ellis in the morning on the American Family Radio Network. So, Walker, this was just reprehensible rhetoric from this judge that that did mock uh, this, this poor woman's health. And I thought, hopefully, we'll set up an appeal uh, based on just sentencing reconsideration. This is obviously a uh, way too long, but I think the wider and more important question is why is the Biden Justice Department targeting conservatives and Christians for what in this instance literally was a peaceful protest? Yeah, you know, the left does this thing called peaceful protest. Well, actually, they don't do peaceful protests. They burn down buildings and destroy property. We saw this with the pro-Hamas protest on college campuses within the last 30 to 60 days. Uh, but what's going on here at the root of it, to your question, is a full intimidation campaign uh, used to discourage any dissident, anyone who disagrees with the regime in power. We're going to punish them. We're going to punitively go after them. We're going to humiliate them. We're going to mock, embarrass them, and lock them up. That's the strategy you're here. And what's quite ironic is President Trump during the campaign in 2015 and early 2016 was notorious for uh, the chance of lock her up, not himself, but the, the, the supporters at the rallies. They were chanting lock her up, talking about Hillary Clinton, who had uh, alleged countless uh, crimes uh, when it comes to uh, passing classified emails and her handling of classified documents, all of that. And then you've got the Uranium One uh, pay to play with with actually Russia, with Putin. So the Democrats are the criminals here. Uh, but Biden and his crew at the DOJ are making sure that anyone who doesn't like and disagrees with their Marxist ideology at any chance they get, they're going to lock up their political opponents. And it isn't just President Trump. It's grandmothers across the country. It's January Sixers. Anyone they can lock up, they will. And they have zero regard for the truth or for equal justice under the law. 
Yeah, and, and it really is concerning to me from a, a conservative and a policy standpoint and for the future of America when the response to this from a lot of the, the Republican and the MAGA base is just to go ahead and lock up our political opponents as well. I mean, that should not be uh, the response in my view. I mean, I think that that uh, Republican attorneys general and maybe DAs need to be more aggressive and say, okay, if you guys want to arm yourselves with weaponizing the law, then we'll give you a taste of, of your own medicine uh, where it's deserving. But what really should be the policy solution here when you have a clearly a, a runaway uh, liberal overarching party that is willing to take this kind of nuclear option? Yeah, well, what we have to do is is neither party can be the party that says, well, we're going to punish our political opponents a little bit harder under the law than we than we would otherwise do maybe our allies in the movement. And that's unfortunately what's happened here. And, and the Democrats have led the charge. So this the, these people in the Republican side are saying, let's just get them back, right? Let's lock them up. Well, that's really not a good approach either, because then it's just going to be who's in power depends on who gets locked up. And that's not a good way to operate. But in reality, what we just right. simply need is equal equal application of the law. So, so if we want to create this standard that if you peacefully protest and block the entrance of an abortion clinic or any other uh, uh, entity, then you get locked up for two years. If that's the new standard, then we have to apply it to everybody. So the next time we have the Green New Deal activists uh, block the uh, the entrance to the Smithsonian Smithsonian's Museum, are we going to lock them up for two years? That's the question. And of course, the answer is no. This is ridiculous. It's a peaceful protest. Nobody's harmed. No property is damaged. And they the, the police remove them from the property. So at a minimum, it's a trespass charge maybe 12 months of probation, but two years in the federal penitentiary? Are you kidding me? So no, the reality is, is nobody wants to adopt this new standard except the Democrats. And the new standard is extremely dangerous where you punish more your political opponents than you do anyone else. Yeah, and you raised such a great point, Walker, that uh, the police in the the local areas can deal with you know minor trespass violations. Um, why do we need the federal government coming in and doing the police work of the states uh, that are perfectly capable of handling it themselves? Um, there should be. Uh, some measure of federalism that we see in the, in the U.S. Constitution that reserves some of these things to the states rather than the federal government. So it seems to me that the DOJ is really overstepping because of uh, the edicts that are coming out of Attorney General Merrick Garland, uh, Biden, and you know, and, and now Merrick Garland was uh, grilled yesterday in front of Congress um, for potentially you know a, a issuing an order basically to um, the prosecutor in the Trump New York case, and of course he denied that. But Jim Jordan and others are asking for all communications to say you know hey if there's nothing to see here then turn over what you got, and um, and we'll see if that comes about, but there really do need to be some parameters here on what actually is the purview and the jurisdiction of the DOJ versus just leaving some of this up to the states. Yeah, and and, and one thing that Republicans can do, because it's not as if we're just sitting on our hands and nobody can do anything and it's whatever Biden says. That's just completely not true. It's the Republicans in the House of Representatives and the Senate that have fully funded this Biden weaponization of the FBI and the DOJ. Jack Smith's budget comes from Mike Johnson and the Republicans. Uh, Alvin Bragg's grant money that goes to his office in New York and New York City, that comes from the DOJ's grant budget. So uh, the reality is, is that Republicans have signed off, not all, but most Republicans have signed off to fully funding the budgets for the DOJ and the FBI so that the weaponization can occur. So the reality is, and I'm not saying we fully defund the FBI, fully defund the DOJ, that's practically not going to happen. There are good things that the DOJ and FBI do, such as hunting down MS-13, hunting down child rapists, hunting down uh, child pornographers. I mean, there are good things, uh, the drug cartels that the FBI does, but the bad things that they do like this should be 100% defunded. But that's not even a topic of discussion. I mean, why is President Trump not encouraging the Republican Party of which he controls virtually uh, to defund the Jack Smith uh, prosecutorial team? I mean, these guys have millions of dollars to spend going after Trump. Why aren't they defunded? You bet. 
if Nancy Pelosi and Hakeem Jeffress had the power of the purse, they would completely defund any witch hunts going after their political allies. Yeah, oh, of course. And this is where uh, the the politicking and using the rules to your advantage uh, is completely within the discretion of Congress. And of course, the Democrats would. I mean, when you look at uh, their willingness in the Senate to just ignore the impeachment articles that were filed against Secretary Mayorkas, I mean, if the Republicans had done that during the Trump uh, impeachments, one or two, it would have been news and headlines and this is the death of the Constitution and how can we possibly get here? And nobody about the law. I mean, all of that rhetoric from the Democrats, but they're perfectly willing to use their power and play by the rules in some instances. Of course, you know, they break rules at other times. But in those instances where it is a matter just of political will, the Democrats seem to have it and Republicans don't. Why aren't more conservatives talking about that? Yeah, some are, but but some are also lofting unrealistic expectations and goals out there. And I like Vivek Ramaswamy. I think he's I think he's a genuine person. I know you're friends with him, but he's been talking about shutting down agencies. And there are some that you could legit shut down tomorrow and nobody would get their feelings hurt. Department of Education, for example, maybe even the ATF. Some of these could be shut down. Nobody would miss a beat. Nobody would get harmed. No harm, no foul. But shutting down the FBI and the DOJ, that's one thing he's lofted. I don't think that's practically reasonable. I mean, in what day and age are we going to shut down the entirety of the DOJ and the FBI? There is so much that they do that is actually good stuff uh, that you can't just shut it down overnight. So we need to be careful about what we promise voters. They need severe yeah. reform. That's what they need. Yeah, we need to be a little more nuanced in our policy and not just go for, um, you know, kind of these viral tweets on social media. But Walker Wildman, really appreciate it. We'll be right back with more. Well, if you are a chat GPT or Grok prolific user by now and think that AI is really great technology, there are some that are actually more concerned. Uh, this headline I found very interesting. It says open AI insiders warn of a quote, reckless race for dominance. So Jake Denton is a tech policy advisor at the Heritage Foundation. And he joins me now to continue to talk about artificial intelligence and uh, some of the ways that we, in terms of, of American policy, need to understand understand that I think that this is really more of an arms race than anything else, Jake. Yeah, absolutely. That's the correct characterization here. These companies are moving as quickly as they possibly can to you know, break into the next tier of this technology. They want to make sure that they're in the lead because this is really going to define our future. You're not going to be able to escape this stuff, whether you're in enterprise, whether you're just using your device on a daily basis, it's going to be everywhere and they want to win. Uh, what's really interesting about this story of the staffers, though, is they're not alleging illegal behavior. They're alleging that you know OpenAI is engaging in this race. They want to win the race, and they want to slow OpenAI down. Not because you know they're scared of this illegal activity that isn't happening. It's because they're worried that the technology is going to really break their stranglehold on the control of culture in Silicon Valley. This thing uh, really doesn't see the world the way that the coders do, and they want to make sure it conforms to that ideological uh, structure. So in terms of conservative policy and um, America interested or America first policy, what does winning the AI arms race really look like? Yeah, well, it's technology that is built in the open and serve in service of worldviews far beyond just what the coastal elite want. I think really what's uh, at stake here is AI systems built behind closed doors, behind walled gardens that we can't peer, uh, view into. And that is not going to reflect the demand that we have for systems that will actually improve our daily lives. Instead, they'll be like kind of just novel applications in service of big business or, you know, these kind of corporate objectives. When in reality, this stuff could have a trickle down effect in every element of our lives, whether it be healthcare or just crafting an email that could be, you know, a really quality of life enhancing technology. So, you know, making sure this stuff is built in the open, not consolidated under a single roof at a company like Microsoft or Google, but spread out across the market. Uh, that is really what we're pushing for. That's the uh, America first vision. Uh, and it's, you know, what we need to beat China. We can't just have Microsoft leading the race, controlling the race. We need every single American company pushing this thing into the future. 
Yeah, and you mentioned the term worldview earlier, and, and I think it's uh, really obvious to anyone who's used Google or has used you know some of this technology that um, is based on Silicon Valley's worldview that is more globalist leftist, obviously, that there are a very easily identifiable indicators of that. And so we want to make sure that AI doesn't have that type of bias. And so um, is there legislation currently pending that addresses this type of issue uh, that really could have an effect on how we build AI out into the future? Unfortunately, no. There's really been nothing uh, crafted that is actually going to address the real concerns or issues. Everything is focused on these either sci-fi scenarios, killer robots, things of that nature, the doomsday stuff that these open AI employees are alleging that really just isn't grounded in reality or it's addressing some like news headline. It's not actually a, a core technological problem confined to AI. It's a, a broader issue. It's a symptom of this kind of uh, long history of not addressing tech policy. We don't have real AI policy being proposed, whether it be in Congress or at the state level, that actually solves any of these you know, real issues, these issues of maybe viewpoint discrimination or uh, you know, these tools handling data in an unsavory manner. That's what we really need to solve for now. It's not these kind of fantasy scenarios of killer robots. It's how it affects you and I in our day-to-day -day lives. Yeah, and that makes a lot of sense that people are much more focused on you know some of the Terminator style uh, kind of uh, worst case scenarios, but not really on some of the practical application. And so what could states um, or the federal government in particular do to ensure that America is protected when it comes to the AI uh, race really against China and other countries that do not share our worldview? Well, really, the good news is here, I think the best thing we can do is just enforce existing competition policy standards. We should not have market consolidation. We can't have Microsoft going over and really just building up dependencies across the market. You know, if you're an AI firm, you're essentially dependent on the structure that Amazon has built. We can't, or Amazon, Microsoft has built. We can't have that. You know, this isn't a, a world where it can live and die by a single company. We need a bunch of small players. We can't have them you know, picked up right at the beginning and never see their full potential. So that is really the goal here. Lawmakers need to enforce competition policy standards, actually pursue anti-competitive behavior when they see it. And I think we'll live in a better you know, AI and tech ecosystem writ large. Yeah, uh, well, I agree with you, and I really appreciate the work that the Heritage Foundation is doing to call attention to these issues and hopefully influence some legislation and policy. So, Jake Denton, really appreciate your commentary and your insights as always. That's all the time we have here on Jenna Ellis tonight. I'll see you tomorrow night.